All right, here we are, Luke Acts for Beginners, lesson number 13. This is the last lesson in the Luke portion of this series. Next week we will begin the Book of Acts portion of the series. Uh, the title of this particular lesson, The Consummation, it's part two of this section, and we'll be covering Luke 23, 26 to 24, 53. So let's begin by looking back at our outline that we have been following throughout this uh, uh, throughout this course. Uh, the beginning, Jesus' um, uh, start in ministry, Jesus in Galilee, the next section, covers the uh, time uh, of His ministry in the northern part of the country. Jesus facing Jerusalem, the events and the dialogue and the teaching that takes place as He is uh, heading towards Jerusalem. Jesus entering Jerusalem, uh, the, um, again, the events that take place in and around uh, Jerusalem and the consummation, uh, his suffering, uh, his cross, uh, and his, uh, uh, his uh, burial and uh, resurrection. Now I mentioned the fact that we followed a geographical outline of Jesus' ministry because Luke, in wanting to establish a historical narrative of Jesus' life and ministry, uh, for his reader, Theophilus, remember this, this is a letter addressed to one person, Theophilus, he does this by framing events in Jesus' life using two factors. One is time, the time of year, or the time of a certain festival, or a time in history, depending on who ruled politically, or who led religiously. He names who was the high priest at what time. Uh, and all of these things can be verified uh, historically. And then he also uh, frames uh, his gospel according to place, where things happen, so that the various incidents are grouped based on where Jesus was at the time. So this is how our outline has been developed. Unlike Matthew and Mark, and later John, who um, each had a theological theme into which their accounts are poured. For example, um, in Matthew, Matthew writes about Jesus as the uh, Jewish Messiah. And Mark writes about Jesus as the divine one. And the book of John, Jesus, both God and man. So Luke's goal is to set Jesus, the Son of God, into a historical context. And for this, you need to first establish the actual time and the places, you know, the when and the where, all of these events of Jesus' life and ministry took place. Now, as far as our study of Luke's gospel is concerned, we're reviewing the last three of the 10 final events of his passion. Uh, and we said that passion is the, is the short form term that we use that covers all of the events surrounding Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. So the 10 um, events of the passion, Gethsemane, uh, his betrayal and arrest, Peter's uh, denial, uh, his trial before Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests, his first trial before Pilate, then he is sent before Herod, second trial before Pilate, and the things we are covered today, his torture and cross, his death, and his uh, burial, and after this, of course, the resurrection. So in our last lesson, we reviewed Pilate's failed attempts to save Jesus and his cowardly acquiescence to the Jewish leaders and mob to have Jesus, a man he knew was innocent, he knew he was innocent, but he had him executed anyways. So in this, our final lesson in the series, let's examine the last three events in our Lord's Passion of the Cross and the glorious conclusion to Luke's Gospel. So let's begin, we'll begin at, uh, exactly, number eight in the Passion, His torture uh, and the cross. Let's read verse 26. When they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And following him was a large crowd of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. 
So Luke foregoes any description of the scourging and the psychological torture administered by the, um, the Roman soldiers prior to Jesus' execution. This torture, however, takes its toll as the Romans press Simon, a Jew, to carry the cross for the exhausted Jesus. Now in another gospel, in the gospel of Mark, Mark names two of Simon's sons who later became prominent members of the church. That's in Mark 15, 21. Uh, the women, it says, you know, the, the women were mourning and lamenting. This means that they were expressing the traditional bewailing for a person who was as good as dead. And judging by his answer to their cries, these were not his disciples because he tells them to stop mourning for him and begin mourning for themselves. This a prophetic reference to the terrible suffering and destruction that'll take place uh, in 70 AD when the Romans will come in and they'll destroy the city and they'll kill everyone. Uh, when he says the green wood, well the green wood is Jesus in his sinlessness and the, and the dry is the Jewish nation in its guilt. Uh, basically what he's saying is, if this is what happens to the innocent, you know, him, torture, death, if this is what happens to the innocent, imagine what will happen to the, to the guilty. So Luke mentions the two criminals, thieves, that Pilate chose to execute with Jesus as a, as a show of contempt for the Jews. In other words, this is what I think of your king. He's not even worthy to be crucified by himself. I'll crucify him and a couple of thieves next to him. They're all the same to me. Next section would be the crucifixion and death, Luke 33 to 49. I want you to note that Luke's description of this event is made up entirely of reactions, not actions. Verse 33, so keep that in mind. What Luke writes, when he writes about the, uh, the crucifixion itself, it's all, it's all about how people reacted to it. All right, let's go through it. Verse 33. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. So the opening verse sets the scene in the briefest way possible. Jesus is crucified with the thieves, crucified to his right and left. Perhaps Luke knew that his Gentile reader was familiar with this Roman style of execution and needed no explanation. Um, let's begin at verse 34. Well, in verse 34, we see Jesus' reaction to his own crucifixion. It says, but Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. So Jesus will speak several times but his first reaction to all that has happened to him is to plead to God for mercy and forgiveness for those who have put him on this cross. Now we tend to read this and kind of, you know, we go over it. Well, of course, Jesus would do this. After all, he's the son of God. He's full of love and mercy. You know, and we don't think that later on God answered this prayer because a few weeks later, Peter and the apostles would be offering God's forgiveness for all sin to these very same people as he preached the gospel from the pilgrim gate at the temple in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 verse 14 to 42. The thousands of people who were there listening to Peter preach, many of those were you know, part of this crowd. Who knows how many in this crowd at the cross were among the 3,000 baptized on Pentecost Sunday. And so the clothing and the effects of the condemned man were the property of the soldiers who were tasked with the execution and uh, they divided it um, accordingly. So we see Jesus' reaction. Next, Luke talks about the people's reaction, verse 35a. It says, and the people stood by looking on. Now Luke will mention the crowd of general population later on, but for now he says they are mainly quiet. I mean, now that the awful outcome and reality of what they were shouting for and what they were demanding in the heat of the moment, being stirred up by the, uh, the, the religious leaders, the result of all of that now stands before them and they're reduced to silence. Not so funny now, not so exciting now. After all, crucified and slowly dying in excruciating pain before their eyes was not a murderer or a thief, they knew that. 
but the teacher from Galilee, a Jew like themselves, put to death before them by pagan soldiers. They had nothing to say now. Now that the awful result of what they demanded just a few hours before was before them in all of its awful spectacle. Next, Luke talks about the Jewish leaders and their reaction, verse 35b. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And so the ones who actually spoke did so in cruelty, actually mocking a dying man. They used his crucifixion as the final proof of their claim that he was an imposter. See, we told you so. This is pretty much what they're saying. If he's the Messiah, the Christ of God, let him save himself from this execution. The fact that he is not doing so and cannot do this, in their minds, also proves that his claims of saving other people are also false. In other words, if he can't save himself, all this talk about him saving you, well, that's nonsense as well. Now the blasphemy is not only against the Son of God, but also against the Father that they insult as well. Next, Luke turns his attention to the Roman soldiers and their reaction, verse 36 to 38. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, this is the king of the Jews. So the soldiers' insults are directed less at Jesus as an individual and more at the Jewish people. I mean, if you, were, if you were a Roman soldier, being stationed in Judea was not exactly the best assignment. <laughs> this was not a great career move if you have to, happen to be stationed in Judea. You were far from Rome and civilization. You were among a rebellious people with a fanatical devotion to their very strange religion. Their attitude was, we dare you to come down from the cross. The inscription said, this is the king of the Jews, but the sentiment behind the inscription said, this is what we think of and what we do to anyone who declares that he is the king of the Jews or king of anything for that matter. This is how we treat the king of the Jews, with contempt, with cruelty, with forth. It was a brutal show of force and a warning to other would-be troublemakers. You know, they, usually the Romans, they left the people who were crucified, they just left them on the cross, not, not just for a day or two, they just left them there for weeks till the body was decomposing. A, 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 a cruel reminder to the people who would walk by every day seeing these crosses, uh, who was in charge and what would happen to you uh, if you bucked the system. Luke now uh, talks about or, or writes uh, about the two thieves and their reaction in verse 39 and 40, one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. And so Luke spends time describing the reaction of the two convicted thieves hung on either side of, of Jesus. Both Matthew and Mark say that Jesus was being reviled by both thieves at first. So at first, both of the thieves were hurling insults at him. Now we get an idea of what was being said since Luke preserves some of the dialogue. One thief incorporates what the Jewish leaders said by goading Jesus to save himself and both of them as well, if he is the Messiah. You know, we often think that the other thief did nothing special in coming to Christ. He just, you know, at the very last moment of his life, he says, hey, look, you know, it's like a big Hail Mary pass. Look, uh, you know, if you're the Son of God, look, uh, remember me. You know, I, want, I want to make it in as well. However, think, for a moment, what that thief had to, you know, what had to go through his mind. He had to first of all rebuke his fellow criminal 
and contradict the soldiers and the Jewish leaders publicly in defending Jesus and then uh, you know, abase himself, submit himself and ask for mercy. I mean, he was a thief, but somewhere and somehow he knew of the kingdom to come. As a Jew, he probably was referring to the kingdom at the end of the world, and he wanted to be part of that. It's interesting to note that Jesus promised that he would be in paradise, in heaven, with Jesus that day. Interesting point here, that very day. This is not only a forgiveness of sin, but it's also a prophecy. Normally it took three or four days to die of the, the crucifixion. But because of the approaching Sabbath, the Jews had Pilate to instruct his soldiers to break the legs of the men on the cross to hasten their death. Imagine that for a moment. Here are the religious leaders. They want to be able to lead the, 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 the nation you know, in prayer uh, for a, a high holy day to, to a loving God. And in order to do this, uh, they recommend or they suggest or they insist that the governor uh, torture these poor men on the cross in order to expedite their death. Uh, the reason for the broken legs? With broken legs, the crucified could not support themselves. You know, they, they would sink down, they couldn't push up. And in doing so, they had trouble breathing, so eventually they died, they suffocated. That was the cause of death when they broke their legs. Now the thief had no way of knowing that he would die and thus be with Jesus on that particular day, making Jesus' words both an absolution of sin as well as a prophecy. He said, today you'll be with me, meaning you're going to die today, and that was not the expectation or the history of crucifixions. Now the old argument, the thief on the cross was saved without being baptized, so baptism is not necessary for salvation. Uh, I have to touch on this particular uh, notion uh, here uh, because this is the excuse that a lot of people use to refuse to be baptized or to you know, relegate baptism as simply a ritual that has no meaning, has no uh, command. And the way to answer that is the following. When Jesus healed the paralytic and also forgave him his sins, and I have to go over to Mark chapter two here, Jesus said, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, you're healed, you know, pick up your mat and walk. Now while among the people, while on earth, Jesus forgave people's sins by the exercise of his will. I mean, he's the son of God. He has the authority to say, your sins are forgiven, knowing what is to come in the future. And so this is what he is doing for the thief on the cross, as he did for the paralytic. He forgave his sins. He was, obviously, he was on the cross. He was in the process of dying, but he was still alive and he was still on earth. And he still had the authority to forgive sins to whom you know, he chose. Now, after his resurrection and just before his ascent into heaven, he left his apostles with final instructions concerning salvation um, that now that he would no longer be on earth. You know, while he was on earth, he could do that. Now he's leaving and he leaves his apostles uh, the message of the gospel. And so we read familiar passages, Matthew 28. And Jesus came up, this is after his resurrection now. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Another passage in Mark 16. And He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And then in Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So uh, we see here, Jesus gives to the apostles the authority to uh, 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 preach the gospel. And now forgiveness of sin comes how? It comes by faith in Jesus, repentance, and uh, baptism. 
Um, it's also fitting that Jesus' final act of ministry is the result of His demeanor while suffering uh, on the cross. He was forgiving His enemies. This had a great impact on the thief that was uh, crucified beside Him. Uh, crucified beside Him. And so that touches Him and draws Him uh, to Jesus uh, and uh, Jesus um, offers one more soul uh, the opportunity to be saved and to be with Him in heaven. All right, a little digression there. When, when we're asked about the thief on the cross, uh, you know, the shorter answer is, uh, while Jesus was on earth, He directly forgave people's sins. He could do that and He did it in several uh, occasions. After His resurrection and ascension, He left instructions with His apostles on how sins were now to be forgiven, how people now were to come to Him in faith, repentance, and baptism. All right, let's move back to Luke and some of the reactions. Let's take a look at the centurion's reaction. Uh, Luke 23, 44 and 5. Uh, it says, uh, it was now about the sixth hour and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. So Luke only describes two of the signs that occurred at Jesus' death. The first was darkness from noon to 3 p.m. This was a sign of divine judgment for what has taken place. You know, uh, execution of the Son of God. He's the light of the world, right? And so when He's executed, what happens? The light for a time, the light in the world uh, is extinguished. And also the tearing of the veil. Inside the temple in itself, there was a heavy veil that separated the inner room, the Holy of Holies, that's where the Ark of the Covenant was, from the outer room, the holy place. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was inside the Holy of Holies where the priest, only the high priest, would enter once per year to offer sacrifice in order to make atonement for his sins and the sins of the people. And the separation was there, you know, the curtain separating the two, the fact that the high, only the high priest could go in and only once a year. Um, uh, the message there was that there was a separation between God and the people. Only one person could go before God and he could only go once per year before God and he could only go after fulfilling certain very important conditions. So the message was to the people, you cannot come. An ordinary man, sinner, cannot come before God. But when the veil was torn in two, the significance here was that there would no longer be a restriction to the throne of, to the throne of grace. The way was now open. Everyone now could come before God to receive forgiveness. In Matthew 27, 50 to 53, Matthew notes that there was also an earthquake and after His resurrection, many other believers were raised from the dead and appeared to people in Jerusalem. Luke reports that after witnessing the scene, the centurion in charge of the detail is himself converted. Mark quotes him as saying, truly this man was the Son of God. So when you put you know, Mark and Luke together, you get the full story of this centurion. So the Jews were silent and the Jewish leaders were cruel and mocking, but the actual crucifixion brought two sinful souls to salvation. The thief who died with Jesus and the centurion who executed both of them. Luke moves on to talk now about the Jewish crowds and all the crowds who came together for this spectacle when they observed what had happened began to return beating their breasts. So the people who had not accepted him now mourned his passing. Luke notes that they came out to see a show. He uses the word spectacle you know, a circus, come on, hey, they're crucifying somebody, let's get out there, let's take a look. But they were much less enthusiastic after actually witnessing the cruelty and the brutality of Jesus' execution. 
You know, we have this term nowadays, you, you see something, you see an accident, you see something ugly, you can't unsee it. It's in, it's in your brain, right? Well, they could not unsee this. There's a difference between you know, Hollywood, in the movies, that type of violence and death, you know, sometimes, whoa, whoa, people got blown up. Oh, did you see that guy, he got shot 50 times. You know, we, it's not real, right? But if you're driving by and, and you happen to see an accident, you actually see the accident. You, act to, you actually see a broken body, someone bleeding, someone perhaps dying. That's a, a completely different experience. It's, uh, it's shocking. And so they were shocked by what they had seen. And then there are the believers and disciples who were there, verse 49, he says, and all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance seeing these things. Here there's no comment as to their feelings or expressed thoughts, only that they were witnesses of the death. Note that Luke does not include the names or references to any of the apostles. All right, so we move on, that's the crucifixion. We move on to the burial of Jesus, verses 50 to 56, not going to read that here. Luke only mentions Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, who had not agreed to their accusations of Jesus as the one who buried Jesus. And he makes reference to the women who noted his place of burial with plans to return, you know, to properly take care of the burial you know, after the Sabbath. Luke may have limited this information, sensing that Theophilus, his reader, a Gentile, would probably have very little interest in Jewish burial rites. We move on now to the resurrection itself. That's the passion, those 10. You know, with the burial is the, is the end of the section that we call the passion. Luke now talks about the resurrection. So let's read his account. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings only and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Now there are many old renditions of uh, Jesus' resurrection some of them showing the soldiers frightened or an angel roll away, rolling away the, uh, the stone so that Jesus can uh, get out. You know, I mean, sincere paintings, imaginings of that, of that moment, of that event. But let's take a look at the actual sequences as the Bible explains them. First, early Sunday morning, Jesus resurrects and leaves the tomb. No one is aware of this. None of the Gospels describe this. They only describe the things that happened after to prove that it had actually taken place. Next, there was an earthquake which coincided with the descent of an angel who rolled away the stone, not to let Jesus out, he rolled away the stone to show that it was already empty and the angel sat on the stone. Next event. The soldiers guarding the tomb fainted. They didn't faint because they saw Jesus. Jesus didn't appear to pagans. They fainted because of the angels. Next event reported, the women find the tomb empty, which is where Luke picks up his story. He only starts there. He doesn't describe the things that happened before. The angels then speak to the women. Luke adds that there were two angels, confirming that Jesus spoke of this, his resurrection, 
uh, happening. At which point they go tell the apostles what they have seen. Where else are they going to go? Luke also reports that there is disbelief among the apostles, but nevertheless Peter and John rush to the tomb to see for themselves. He says Peter goes, but the other the gospel writer says Peter and John together went. So after these events take place, the gospel writers and Paul later on will record a number of appearances by the risen Jesus. Uh, Mary Magdalene, for example, in Mark 16, John 20. Uh, other women he appeared to in Matthew 28. Peter in Luke 24, verse 34, he appears to Peter. Uh, and two disciples on the road to Emmaus in Mark 16 and Luke 24. Now let's talk a little bit about this episode where he appears to these two disciples who were on their way to Emmaus. We no longer know where this city is located, about five to seven miles from Jerusalem. These were two disciples on their way home discussing what they have recently witnessed in Jerusalem. And while they're walking and talking, Jesus joins them, but they are prevented from recognizing Him. They tell Jesus that they were uh, hoping that Jesus would have been the Messiah, but now that He has been tortured and killed, you know, they're not so sure. They hoped that the Messiah would be like David, you know, a great warrior king. In the Old Testament, however, Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, the prophet Isaiah presented the Messiah not as a warrior king, but as a figure of suffering and servanthood. Actually, in our day and time, many Jews see this as a personification of their nation as a whole, even to this day. You ask them, who is the Messiah? They'll say, well, you know, many of them will say, well, the Jewish nation is the Messiah, the suffering that it has uh, incurred uh, over, uh, over the years. Of course, you ask them, um, other descriptions of the Messiah, uh, that he was meek and lowly, uh, that doesn't quite fit the character of the Jewish nation that was always uh, stubborn and rebellious, so the, uh, the analogy doesn't work you know, all the way through. Anyways, Jesus explains to these two disciples that the Messiah would have two profiles. First, he would be the suffering servant. Jesus' suffering was not a failure or a mistake, but a complete fulfillment of the Messiah's mission according to the prophets, especially Isaiah. And number two, a glorious Savior. As David defeated Israel's enemies, Jesus with His death and resurrection defeats mankind's greatest enemy, which is death. So as darkness approached, Jesus went into their home to share a meal. And as he broke and blessed the bread, Luke writes that their eyes were open and they recognized him, at which point he vanished from their sight. So Luke goes on to describe their joy and their return to Jerusalem that very night to tell the apostles of their experience. So now the apostles, the disciples from Emmaus and other disciples are together. And Luke completes the appearance of Jesus to the Emmaus disciples um, or rather he compares uh, the uh, appearance of Jesus to the Emmaus disciples to his next appearance to these same disciples now that they have returned to Jerusalem. So they've, they've walked with him a good part of the day. They've eaten with him. They recognize who he was. They, they, they turn around and run back to uh, Jerusalem to find the apostles. They're with the apostles telling them uh, their experience and while they're telling them about their experience, Jesus appears to all of these people. So let's just read that. It says, while they were telling these things, He Himself stood in their midst and said to them, peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And He said to them, why are you troubled and why do you doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. So the Lord confirms the witness of these two as well as the witness of the women 
by now appearing to the apostles while they are together. And we find out from Mark and John that only Thomas was not there at the time. And I, you know, I think, what, have you ever had the opportunity to say, I told you so? Imagine the two disciples you know, on the, who came back and told the apostles that they had seen the Lord. What an I told you so they had uh, to, uh, to say once Jesus appeared among them. Anyways, in verses 44 to 49, Jesus provides for the apostles the teaching and the information that He had given to the two disciples from Emmaus. Luke also provides a short summary of the Great Commission, more fully stated in Matthew 28 and Mark 16. At this appearance, Luke sets up a bridge for the next letter that he's going to write to his reader, Theophilus, called the Acts of the Apostles. And he does this by instructing the apostles to remain in Jerusalem until they receive power from on high. So there's the set, Jesus, he reports, Luke reports, that Jesus says to the apostles, stay in Jerusalem. The natural thing for them to want to do after His ascension would be to go back home to Galilee. But Jesus says, no, stay in Jerusalem until you receive power. And so uh, in the way Luke writes this, he establishes you know, the setting for his next book or his next letter, which is called the Acts of the Apostles. And so he doesn't explain any further and he leaves his reader anxious to see what this might mean. There were other appearances by Jesus, but not recorded by Luke and these, are uh, the appearance to Thomas, John records that, the appearance to the apostles when they were together in Galilee, Matthew 28, Mark 16, the apostles at the Sea of Galilee, you know, when they went out to fish, John chapter uh, 21, and then non-gospel appearances. Uh, Paul talks about uh, Jesus appearing to 500 disciples that were together at one time, to his earthly brother James, and of course to Saul or Paul after uh, his ascension. And then there is, there, there, there's the, um, the story of the apostles at Jesus' ascension. In other words, He appeared to them just before He ascended into heaven. I want to read that short verse. It says, and He led them out as far as Bethany. See, once again, He didn't have to say that. But if somebody says to you, you know, where, where, where did it happen, the ascension? Well, it happened near the town of Bethany. We know where Bethany is. It's always situating the spiritual and the miraculous and grounding it in history and geography. So, and he led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping Him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. So Luke, as he has done throughout his gospel, uh, as I said before, mentions the place of the ascension, Bethany, uh, not far from Jerusalem. Their natural inclination when the Lord was gone, as I mentioned, was to return home to family and friends. Uh, but uh, Jesus uh, commands them actually to stay in Jerusalem. Luke notes that after Jesus ascends, they return to Jerusalem where He previously instructed them to remain until they were empowered by the Holy Spirit to carry out their great commission of preaching the gospel to every tribe and every tongue. So in this way, Luke neatly closes out his account of Jesus' life and death and resurrection and His ascension. And he also sets the stage for the story of how the apostles, notably Peter and Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit will establish the church that 2,000 years later we are a part of to this day. So if you're going to you know, jump in with us for the next lessons, the next series of lessons which will cover the book of Acts, then I encourage you to read, begin reading the book of Acts, your reading assignment, Acts chapter 1 verse 1 to Acts chapter 2 verse 47 jam-packed with a lot of information. We have a lot of information, we're going to have information overload for the, uh, our next lesson. So I hope that you'll be with us for that. Well, thank you for your attention. That's the end of our lesson today, the end of our uh, teaching series on the book of Luke. Next week we begin the book of Acts. Thank you very much. God bless you.